Hey, Way family, thank you for tuning in. God has an amazing word for you, so go ahead and check out this message. And after, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We love you. God bless. I'm really glad to see every one of you here today. And we've been on a series called Access Granted. And the most important things that we want or we need in life, we can't find in the physical realm. What do you mean by that is physical things can only make you happy for so long. It's the things that money can't buy that actually are the most important things. These are things in the spiritual realm. And God gave me a word a couple of weeks ago, four weeks ago, and he said, let them know that they have access granted. You know what he's saying is, what I have is available to them. The fact is, is that God's, all of God's resources, his love, his miracles are available to us right now in this room. So right now you might be thinking there's something missing in my life and I understand that. But what's missing, could it be it's not a thing, it's a relationship with God and it's something that you could only get from God himself. May this moment be a time where we place our faith in God once again. Place our faith in Jesus Christ once again. Now the promised scripture or the foundational scripture of this series is this, Philippians 4:19, and it says this, "And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus." So God promises us to supply every one of our needs. That word supply means to fill to the top, that nothing is wanting, to cause to abound, to liberally supp supply. This is what God is saying. When I supply, I supply it to the brim, to overflow, to abundance. Why does God give us abundance? Because he wants you to have more than enough to give to someone else. Today, if you're lacking joy, I want you to focus on, Focus on this word today. That's your need. And you can receive that need right now. The joy of the Lord can be your strength. Maybe you're in this room and you're lacking freedom. You've been stuck and you just can't get, you can't get out of it. There's something holding you back. Well, there's a scripture that says this, who the son says free is free indeed. Why not come into this atmosphere expecting to connect with the power, expecting to, for your needs to be met? He will supply all of your need according to his riches in glory. All your needs means all your necessities, your wants, your lack, your demands. And this is what he said, anything we ask for according to his will, with a sense of urgency and authority and confidence, God will give us anything we ask for with a sense of urgency. Is there, is, is there anyone here that has a sense of urgency? Something has to change. So what God is saying is that I just don't answer prayers that have no passion with them. Today, let's come into this place and realize every single need that you have in your life, in your mind, in your relationships, even in your finances, God is able to supply every single one of your needs. You don't need to go to the world to go to get it. You don't have to, you can't get it from your girlfriend. You don't have to go to the club. You can get this from Jesus Christ right here in this room. We're all searching. Do you know what that means is every single one of us have an area that we're lacking in. And, and we start searching for that empty part of us and we try to fill it ourselves. And this scripture is telling us, stop trying to fill that empty part of your life on your own. Stop, stop thinking that someone or something can fill that emptiness in your heart. It's God that will supply all of your needs, all of my needs, all of our needs, according to his riches in glory. This is good news. Our needs can be supplied. In Psalms 23, 1, it says this, the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. The Lord is my shepherd, I have what? We, everything that we need, we find in our shepherd. He will lead us to every single thing we need. That's why the Bible says, seek first. 
my kingdom, my righteousness, and all these things will be added. This is what he's saying. If you will let, if you will allow me to lead your life, I will lead you to every single one of your needs being met. Maybe our problem is a lack of focus. We stop focusing on Jesus as our supplier and we focus on something else. And as we focus on that other thing, it's leaving us emptier than we've ever been. A Christian that's empty. A Christian is not supposed to be empty. A Christian is supposed to be filled. Why? Because God supplies all your need according to his riches and glory. See, God supplies every one of our needs from his riches. Where does he supply the needs from? His riches. You know what he's saying? It's, it's, it's from my overflow. It's not from your limited, your limited, your limited assets, your limited resources, your limited joy, your limit, limited forgiveness. We are all limited. You know, we'll get depressed if we focus on the answer being us. Because the more I look at me, the more I realize I need God. The more I look at me, I start realizing I, don't, I am not the answer. I need God to be the answer. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough smarts. I don't have enough favor on my own. I'm not, I'm not, I don't have enough. But there's a God that says wherever you fall short, I will make up the difference. I will supply all of your need according to my resources, my riches, my power. And this scripture last week, it's a hit, but I want to read it again. 2 Corinthians 9 8 says this, and God is able to make all grace, every favor and earthly blessing come in abundance to you. He goes, every favor and every earthly blessing Come in abundance to you. Last week I said, why do we need earthly blessings? Because we're on earth. We need earthly blessings right here. He goes, and God is able to make all grace, every favor, and earthly blessing come in abundance to you. So that you may always, so that you may always, under all circumstances, regardless of the need, have complete sufficiency in everything. God says, I want you to have complete sufficiency in everything, being completely self-sufficient in him and have an abundance for every good work and act of charity. That scripture's deep. It seems like it's saying the same thing over and over. Abundance, sufficiency, sufficiency in him, overflow. So you can not only, did we say, not only so your needs can be met, so you have some overflow to do every good work that God is calling you to do. It's time to get a vision bigger than our problems. I'm no longer going to just survive. I'm believing this, that I'm going to have a victory and God's going to call me, this is what he says about me. I'm more than a conqueror. This is what he's saying. I'm not just going to overcome this. I'm going to overcome this with such authority I can help someone else overcome. My marriage problem will turn into a marriage ministry. The drug problem will turn into, come on, to turn into a ministry of recovery. The sickness will turn into a healing ministry. The depression will turn into a counsel and ministry. I'm not just going to beat this thing. I'm going to beat this thing with authority and I'm going to have some overflow when I come out of this because God will richly, abundantly meet every need with overflow. You guys get that? So God wants us to have overflow. This is a lifestyle we should be living in. God meeting our needs and then we go out and meet other people's needs through the overflow that God has given us. So now, how do we get access to God's abundance? How do we get access? In Philippians 4.19, it says this, according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Say it with me, in Christ Jesus. Say it with me again, in Christ Jesus. So where do we get access to all of God's resources? We get it in Christ Jesus. It's important to understand where What's the key? The Bible says no one, he goes, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. The only way to get to the source is through Christ Jesus. You cannot get his blessings through religion. You cannot get his blessings through your own good works. 
You could get the blessings of God, the abundance of God one way, the riches of God one way in Christ Jesus. Say it with me again, in Christ Jesus. Now, I want to talk about that for, for a good second here because the most important thing we can get from Jesus is not a thing. It's not, it's not money. It's not health. It's not a healing. It's not even a sound mind. The greatest thing that we could ever get from Jesus is salvation. Salvation. And I want to sit here for a minute and I want to talk about this. We gain access to salvation through Christ. Why am I going to talk about salvation for tonight? Because it's the most important need that every single person has in this room. The saddest thing in the world is to go to church for 10 years and die and not be saved. You're in this church and you're not born again. You know what that means? Is that you're going through the motions, you're trying to behave good, but you've never been saved. Salvation is only found in one name. It's the name of Jesus. Let's talk about that for a minute. Can we talk about that? Acts chapter 4, this is what it says, verse 11. This Jesus is the stone which was despised and rejected by you. He was talking to a group of people that when Jesus came as their Savior, when Jesus came to, to die for their sins and raise again from the dead and give them hope. This is what they did. They rejected him. You know what this scripture is saying? That we could accept them or we can, we can accept them or we can reject. So he was talking to a group of people that actually rejected him. The builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. Verse 12. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among people by which we must be saved. For God has provided the world no alternative for salvation. This scripture answers people, and you run into, especially young people, when you're going to a university or you're in a high school. And then they'll talk about religion a little bit. And then they'll say something like this, and I've heard it. All paths lead to God. There's all paths lead to God. I had someone, uh, I had someone last month tell me, this is what they told me. They told me, basically all religions teach the same thing. And then he thought that was going to get him a pass on the conversation. I do, and I told him, do you know that Jesus did not say all paths lead to the same place? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. The scripture says that God has given us no alternative to be saved. There's only one option. Why one option? Because God is... I want you to get this. God is precise, and I thank God that he, didn't, he took all the guesswork out of it. He was saying, you want to be saved? Here's the test. There's only one answer, A, Jesus. It's not A, B, C, or all above. God knows how we are, and we would come up with other alternatives. So God says there's only one way, no other alternative, for men and women to be saved. They must be saved all the same way by calling on the one name that can save, and that's the name of Jesus. Jesus saves. Say with me. Jesus. This is an important subject because I really believe this. The church overall in America is ignorant on the most important subject. What I mean by that is they don't know the plan of salvation. And sad to say, many members of churches, church goers are not saved. 
I asked someone the other day that goes to church on a regular basis, I go, for what? I go, why do you go to church? Because I ask him this question, if you were to die right now, do you know where you spend eternity? He goes, I don't know. How long you been going to church? He goes, 10 years. I go, so you've been going to church for 10 years for what? You're supposed to go to worship because you receive something and you're grateful and you're learning how to reach other people. But he only understood religion and he wasn't sure if he would make it to heaven because he thought there was another way to get saved. He thought maybe if I go to church on a regular basis, I get in. He thought maybe if I behave really good, I get in. But the Bible doesn't say that you get saved by calling on your own name or calling on the name of a religion. If anybody tells you that we have the truth and they're telling all other religions, all other facets of Christianity, they're all lies. Run as fast as you can because the truth is not a religion. A truth is a person. It's Jesus Christ. He's the way, the truth, and the life. This could be the most important message I'll ever speak. Because if we don't understand this message, we could think we're saved, but we're not. So there's no other name. Look at this. There is salvation, verse 12. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among people by which we must be saved. For God has provided the world no alternative for salvation. I love that. I, re I read it again. Salvation. What does salvation mean? It means to rescue. Say it with me, rescue. Do you know we need rescuing? It also means deliverance from the molestation, molestation of enemies and demons. Part of salvation, not only does he rescue you, but God will set you free from demonic molestation. We need to know that. Someone asked me right before service, can demons molest Christians? Well, demons can molest Christians. I want you to get this. That let them molest them. But you don't ever have to let a demon molest you, mess with your mind. You could go ahead, I want you to get this, submit to God, understand that you're saved, you're born again, and you do not need any, to allow any demon to torment your mind. We can be free. Someone say, we can be free. Tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity to be free. Because Jesus says you call on this name and it will rescue you and it will deliver you from molestation of enemies and demons. For this purpose, the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. It's a serious stuff. The enemy's like, whoa, why are we talking about this? Because we're resisting you and we're realizing that we have freedom and we're going to walk in our freedom. It means delivered from the curse to it, delivered from the curse to inherit eternal blessed life, health and wholeness. It also talks about this word salvation, future salvation. The sum of the benefits and blessings which, which the Christians redeemed from their earthly ills will enjoy after the visible return of Christ from heaven in the in, in consummated and, and eternal kingdom of God, in the eternal kingdom of God. I want you to get this. Salvation is now, but salvation is also for the future. Jesus Christ came over 2,000 years ago, but Jesus Christ is coming back. And we don't know when he's coming back, but he come, could, could come back any day. We're living in the last days. The Bible says when the days are like Sodom and Gomorrah, he goes, watch for my return. All that meant was there was perversion all over the world. When the days are like Noah, he goes, watch for my return. You know what that means? The, the days of Noah, when Noah built the ark, he was preaching for over a hundred years and no one was listening. He said, it's gonna rain, it's gonna rain. And people were so party, so busy partying and having a good time, they didn't have time to focus on their salvation. We're living in a world that's consumed with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. 
and they're forgetting that Jesus Christ is coming back. We're going into a time of Thanksgiving next week, going into a time, I want you to get this, for a Christmas celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ, and we're so caught up in the festivities, we don't even know what we're celebrating. We don't know. We as Christians act like everybody around us is saved. And we're so concerned about looking bad or looking stupid that we'd rather someone go to hell than us bring up the subject of salvation. We got to get out of our comfort zone. There's a world that needs to be saved and there's only one name to call on to be saved and it's the name of Jesus. Let's look at this. Salvation now and for eternity. We're saved from four things. Fourfold salvation. Salvation number one, from the penalty of sin. We must know that sin is not free. Every sin has a price on it, a penalty for it. Now and later, sin will begin to destroy your life. You cannot live a life of sin without getting negative results. This is what right now, since Kanye West is on the, on the billboards, number one, uh, Jesus is King, number one uh, uh, album in the world right now. He was sharing how he got saved and delivered probably around six months ago. He said, I had everything this world had to offer. I'm a billionaire. Have the greatest shoe line in the world. People are buying my records. I'm, I, I'm married to Kim Kardashian. He goes, after it was all said and done, I was crazy. I found myself tormented by demons in a mental ward. And my money couldn't save me. Kim couldn't save me. My fame couldn't save me. There was only one name to call on to get saved in that mental ward. The psychiatrist couldn't save me. A pill couldn't save me. A drug couldn't save me because what I needed was salvation. And there was only one name to call on, and it was the name of Jesus. And I called on that name, and he delivered me, and he set me free, and he gave me a sound mind instantly. People asked, I, I, they did an interview on him the other day on the plane. The, word, the praise, the choir's on the plane and there, he's being interviewed. And they say, you know, we have a hard time believing that you're changed. You were here and now you're different. What happened? Do you, uh, do you expect us to, under, to really believe that you're all of a sudden changed from one day to the next? And they asked Kanye that, this is what he said. He goes, this is, let me explain it to you. He goes, I was asleep. And now I'm awake. There's two different states. Everybody that doesn't, that doesn't know Jesus is still asleep. And those that call upon the name of Jesus are finally awake. And they're realizing, whoa, I didn't know there was a life. There was a life like this available to me. I was searching my whole life. And finally I called on the name of Jesus. Salvation. Salvation from the penalty of sin. There's a penalty of sin to sin. The more you sin, the emptier you are. The more you sin, the more depressed you are. The more you sin, the more destructive you become. The more you sin, the angrier you become. The more you sin, the more hate fills your heart. The more you sin, the more you destroy your relationships. There's a penalty for sin, but there's also an eternal penalty for sin. There's people right now that were here with us in 2019, that have gone on to eternity, and they rejected Jesus, and they're in a state right now of eternal separation from God. They played church. They never surrendered their lives to Jesus. They had one foot in the world and one foot with God, and they thought they were saved. You can't get saved with one foot in the world and one foot with God. You got to make up your mind who you're going to serve. <laughs> Penalty. 1 Peter 3.18. 1 
for Christ, the Messiah himself, Jesus, died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous. Check this out. He took our place. He's righteous. He took our place. The righteous for the unrighteous. He says, the price for your sins, the penalty is too severe. I'm going to take it. I'm sinless. I've never sinned. The wage of sin is death. You must suffer. There must be suffering for sin. I will suffer. I will die in your place. The innocent for the guilty. That he might bring us to God. In his human body, he was put to death. But he was made alive in the spirit. His human body was put to death. Why was he put to death? To pay the price for our sins. The wage of sin is death. Someone has to die, and this is a reality. Either you call on Jesus to save you and forgive you, or one day in your future, you'll have to pay the price for every single sin that you've committed. And this is what it means, eternal separation from God in a real fiery hell. I've heard people say, well, this life is hell, and I understand that, because a life apart from God is hell. It's a degree of hell, but it's not the fullness of hell. And it's a degree of hell because it's, it's, over, it's overpowering, and it's, and it's depressing, and it's, and it's hopeless, and it's, and it's dark, and, and, and there's bondage, and... You find yourself in a cycle and it's horrible. You find yourself lying and cheating and hating yourself and becoming a person you never thought you would be. You had control, you thought of the sin, but the tables have turned and now you're becoming uglier in the spirit. You don't even like you anymore. That's what happens. But it's not the fullness of hell. It's just a little bit of hell. And if that's unbearable, imagine being in a real hell forever. He died for us, so we don't have to go there. See, the price must be paid for our sins. Someone has to pay it. The bail must be paid. Thank God he paid a price that we couldn't pay. Jesus paid our bill when he died on the cross. Someone has to pay it. He paid it. But look at 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9, says this. In flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who, do, who don't know God and on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. The good news is Jesus died for our sins and we could call on him and be forgiven, set free from the molestation of demons and we could have a new life and receive a blessed life now and a life, a blessed life for eternity. Even when we die, we'll resurrect from the dead. That's the good news. Yes, we're sinners, but there's a way out. That's the good news. But there's those that refuse to obey the good news. Now, why would someone refuse to obey the good news? I'll tell you why someone would refuse to obey the good news. They love their sin too much. They say something like this, I, 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 I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it one of these days. But I wanna let you know, I'm not a hypocrite. Yes, you are. A hypocrite just means an actor, you're acting. You're acting like you're okay. But when you put your head on that pillow, you know you ain't okay. You can't even handle a little silence. You have to have music playing. You have to have words going on. Because if you just get a little silent, you start hearing the voice of God speaking to you. You're not okay. And at times, we're, when, we're, when we're, we're in that silent moment, we not only hear the voice of God, we hear the voice of demons. Kill yourself. You're nothing. You'll never make it. Look at all the problems. There's no God. Doubt it. Get out of here. Not right now. 
But I thank God that God loved us so much that he brought us in this room. He goes, no, son, I brought you here because what you've been looking for, come on, daughter, what you've been looking for, you can't find out there. I have exactly what we look for, the abundance. I'm the one that can meet every single one of your needs, and I know you better than anybody. This is what God said, call on me. But look what he says. These people that refuse to obey the good news, they refuse to surrender to Jesus. They're being hardheads. They will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. Forever. Once you breathe your last breath, playing church is over. Living the double life is over. You might have faked your mom out. You might have faked the pastor out. You might have faked the membership class out. But understand this. Either you were born again or you weren't. And if you've not repented of your sins and turned to Jesus and say, Jesus, save me. Understand this. You will be on the, on the bad side of this scripture. Separated from the power of God forever. You know what that means is? There's no prayer. There's no freedom. There's no rescue plan. The rescue plan is right now while well, you have breath in your lungs. The enemy's negotiating with you. Come on, I'll give you pleasure for a moment, but I want your soul for eternity. And then Jesus says, come on, give me your pleasure, repent of your sins, and I'll give you pleasure for eternity. God is saying the thing that you've been hoping in, believing in, Strung, uh, strung out on. God has said, I'll set you free and I'll give you something that's way better. Trust in me tonight. You know who's the most miserable person in this room? Is a Christian that's not sold out. Because I, I'll tell you why. Because you're getting the conviction of the Holy Spirit and you're getting the beatings of the devil. <laughs> You're not blessed nowhere. Salvation from the penalty of sin. Second, fourfold, bless, fourfold salvation. Second thing we're safe from. Salvation from the power of sin. Salvation from the power of sin. Romans 6.22, but now you are free from the power of sin and have become slaves of God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. What this scripture is saying is that we in this room, if we'll call upon the name of Jesus, he'll save us from the power of sin. Sin no longer has to have power over us. We can be set free from the power of sin. We no longer need to be controlled by the power of sin. The power of sin, we could be free. The power of sin to condemn us for eternity is broken. There's no sin that you're addicted to in this room, whether it's pornography or a drug or a destructive emotion that Jesus cannot set you free from. Tonight could be your night to be free from the power of sin. Fourfold blessing, fourfold salvation. Salvation from the practice of sin, a lifestyle of sin. Sin is no longer, sin no longer, when you get saved, I want you to guess, sin no longer is pleasurable as it was. Our love for God becomes greater than their desire to sin. This is how you know you're saved. Sin, sin no longer, you could, like, you could no longer practice sin. You become, you become weird at sin. You get drunk and you're quoting John 3.16. I'm just thinking John, God is so good, he's so merciful. Right? You sin. You go out on a one-night stand, 
and after you're done, you're crying and you're, you're, you're trying to witness to the person that you just slept with. I don't know what I was thinking. I'm a Christian. I, was, I don't know what I got here. I was like, I don't know. <laughs> you used to be able to lie like nothing. And now when you start lying, you start stuttering. And they start, are you lying? I don't know. Yeah. Well, yeah. You're trying to be angry and you're saying, bless me, Lord. God, I, mean, I hate you. I love the Lord. I, Because when you're born again, you can no longer practice sin. If you could practice sin with no conviction, you're not saved. 1 John 3, 9 says this. The person who has been born into God's family does not make a practice of sinning. We get set free. Salvation for the practice of sin. Sin no longer can be our lifestyle. The person who's been born into God's family does not make a practice of sin because now God's life is in him. Why can't he continue practicing sin? Because God's life is in him. The power of God is in him. The, the power of the creator of the universe is in him. The power is greater than the sin that's coming against you. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. God begins to rise up. The Holy Spirit begins to rise up and says, no, we will not allow this in your life. This is not you anymore. You've been born again. You've been saved. That's no longer you. You're a woman of God. You're a man of God. I delivered you from this. God's life is in him. So he can't keep on sinning. For this new life has been born into him and controls him. He has been born again. Sin used to control us. Now we're born again. God's spirit controls us. Do you remember when you were in sin, you couldn't help yourself, you kept going? Now something switched. You try to sin and you can't help yourself. You keep coming back to the altars. You keep coming back to church. You keep coming back to the Word because you can't continue to sin because God is in you. And He's not going anywhere. While you're trying to get high, He's right there. Are we going to do this now? Come on, how many know what I'm talking about? You're ready to turn on something you shouldn't be watching, and the Holy Spirit says, I don't think we should be doing this right now. Right, come on. You know this. Do you know, you know you're opening up the, the door to the devil? Yeah, I know. How many get that? As a born-again believer, God's salvation has set us free from the practice of sin. And the last thing, fourfold salvation. Salvation from the presence of sin. He takes our sin away. He totally forgives us and cleanses us of all sin. Do you know why some Christians struggle? It's because they, have, they don't know what Jesus has done for them. First of all, if you're a Christian, I'm going to blow your mind for some of you guys never heard this because you've been confessing the wrong thing for years. If, if you're a Christian, you are no longer a sinner. What? what, what? Yes, I do sin. What? Calm down. I sin all the time, every day, 24-7. <laughs> See, that's a Brad confession right there. You're no longer a sinner because you know what a sinner is? Is one who practices sin. It's a lifestyle. Sin is not my lifestyle. Following Jesus is my lifestyle. What I am now is a saint. I am born again. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Who are you? A follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ. I follow Jesus. Well, you messed up the other day. I get right back up because that's not my lifestyle.
Say, say with me, I'm saved. I'm, I'm a follower of Christ. I am no longer a sinner. You get set free from that. There's a voice speaking to you. No, no, no. You sin. You sin. You sin. You know what the enemy wants to do? He wants you to confess his word over you, your past over you. Come on. Your present failures over you. And if if you're in Christ, you are a new creation. All things pass away and everything's become new. Accept your new identity and speak it over yourself. 1 John 1, 9 says this. But... If we confess our sins to God, he can always be trusted to forgive us and take our sins away. Wow. When you're forgiven, he not only forgives you, he takes all the sin that was on your record. He erases them and takes them totally off your record. It's gone. And if it's gone, why are you still beating yourself up over it? Jesus was beat for your sins. Stop beating yourself up over the sins that God forgave you from. When God, you know, you know the, the other day, you know what I did? I go, didn't you say sorry? Yeah. Well, yeah, you forgave me. Yeah, yeah, you forgave. I forgave you, yeah. But you remember? No. What are you talking about? Old things pass away, everything becomes new. It's not there. What are you talking about, God? It was last week. This is the devil reminding you of your past to keep you in your past life. It's time for you to get over that and say, if Jesus has forgiven me, I'm not going to forgive myself. It's no longer my record. So why am I going to continue paying the price for something Jesus already paid the price for? It's gone. Someone says gone. gone. Someone says gone. And if it's not gone, just confess your sins today. <laughs> and it will be gone. You came here, some of you came with a, with, a, with a load of sin on you. Guilt, shame, condemnation. I'm no good. I'm a horrible Christian. And Jesus saying, aren't you tired of walking around? With all that weight, don't you understand? That's what I did when I went to the cross. I took all your sin so you could give me your sin and I could give you my freedom and I could give you my eternal life and I could give you, come on, I could give you my new beginning and I could give, come on, I could give you what you've been missing. Come on, I'll give it to you. Come on, let's trade your sin for my abundant life. And this is the last scripture, Psalms 103, 12. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. You know what that means? You could be driving east and going flying east And if you don't turn that thing around, it will always be east. What God is saying, when I remove your sin, it's gone as far as the east is from the west. You know what that means? Is I can't, I can't go east. I can't go east and ever turn into west. I'll continue going to east. If I keep going that direction, it's always east. It never matches the North Pole and the South Pole, but the East Pole don't exist. You guys understand that? It's gone. And if it's gone, and if God has forgiven you, and he's removed it, and he saved you, why are you still allowing the enemy to continue to keep you in bondage, keep you under guilt, keep you under shame? It's time to allow God to be God. It's time to call upon the name of Jesus and say, Jesus, save me for real tonight. Is there anybody heard a word for God tonight?
Thank you so much for tuning in to today's message. We pray that you were encouraged and empowered. Don't forget to check out some other messages we have on our YouTube channel and share, subscribe to thewayworldoutreach.org. We love you. God bless you. Have an amazing week.